Hey everybody, it's Chris from Military Aviation History and this is a fairy swordfish. Now this is exactly the sort of plane that I was really looking forward to covering on inside the cockpit. This has been on my bucket list for ages and I'm super excited to bring it to all of you because what we're going to do first off as always I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of this aircraft then we're going to make a walk around and then we're going to jump inside and this episode is of course possible courtesy of Navy Wings an organization dedicated to preserving the history of the fleet air arm and keeping aircraft like this swordfish in a flyable condition so if you're interested in their mission and if you want to support them they are a charity as well check out the description below uh, for a link to their website and all the additional information you can find there now talking about the swordfish where does the history really start well we're in the early 1930s and the greek government due to a requirement in the greek navy approaches ferry asking for a new three-seater reconnaissance aircraft the greeks have been using ferry aircraft for some time they were happy with them so why not go back to the same company right at the same time there's also an interest in the uk via the air ministry in getting a new free seat aircraft uh, slotted for service as well now the greek venture eventually doesn't really amount to much it gets cancelled but the air ministry venture is successful although not without certain mishaps along the way. In 1933, the first prototype takes to the sky. It is called TSR-1. TSR stands for Torpedo Spotter Reconnaissance. That already explains to you sort of the role this aircraft was meant to fulfill. After a couple of test flights, it sadly crashes and uh, that crash, as with many prototypes, is a blessing in disguise because certain kinks in the initial design are identified and then changed. TSR-2 takes to the sky in 1934. It also again crashes in 1935. But by now, the aircraft has convinced the Air Ministry, although it is, let's be honest, already starting to be somewhat obsolete at this point because most countries start to switch to the monoplane for this sort of aircraft by this point in time. But it's still good enough to be put into service. That happens in 1936 after some service trials. By 1938, a year before the Second World War kicks off in Europe, all squadrons that had to have the aircraft replaced with newer models have been equipped with swordfishes. Now, the swordfish will be at the start of the war equipping 13 different squadrons and that number will increase as the war progresses. There's a couple of variants of the swordfish as well that exist. There's the Mark I, which you see here, sort of the original design and the one that really is really closest to that original conception of a torpedo spotter reconnaissance aircraft with, of course, the torpedo already prominently featuring below, as you can see. We then have the Mark II that comes out roughly 1943. It's a little bit more dedicated towards the support role that the swordfish was eventually placed into uh, and featuring, for example, the major change really is that the lower half of the lower wing now has metal covering instead of the dope fabric that you see here on the Mark I. And that would allow, uh, next to the bombs and the depth charges that could already be equipped on the Mark I, also the use of rockets. Because once you fire off a rocket, of course, there's that massive plume of fire and smoke coming out at the back and you don't really when you're firing off your rocket you don't really want to become the rocket yourself do you so that's uh, that's uh, the change there and then there was the mark III, which had an additional anti-submarine warfare uh, radar system installed as well and it's a little bit un gamey, unflattering look really because it gets this massive bulge right between you know, the two gears there that you see and that of course once again highlights sort of how the role of the swordfish changed throughout this time. There's also an unofficial, shall we say, Mark IV variant. Some people call it a Mark IV. Some people just say, well, it's, it's, it's the older Marks just with a enclosed cold weather canopy that was specifically done by the Canadians. So if you're a Canadian viewer, this one's for you. Um, but yeah, that's sort of rounding up the history of the development of the swordfish. The Swordfish, of course, is a hugely popular machine nowadays. And much of this has to do with that underdog status during World War II. And let's be honest, this machine did really well in a couple of engagements that were really pivotal in a certain sense. Uh, we've got the raid on Toronto, of course, and also the attack on and the hunt for the Bismarck, really. And this machine there played a crucial role in, in, of course, both engagements. It must be said next to, of course, 
the plane's abilities to fulfill those missions. There was a little bit of luck on the side as well, especially with the uh, hunt for the Bismarck. And of course, tactical surprise was also an element of success during the Raid of Toronto. We do see the swordfish if it is pushed really in frontline engagements where there's a lot of resistance, a lot of concentrated resistance, like for example, during the Channel Dash when the German Kriegsmarine leisurely strolls down the English Channel, um, that the swordfishes that were sent are just shot out of the sky and they really don't hold up in that frontline engagement. But just because you're obsolescent or in fact obsolete doesn't mean you're useless. And the Allies and the Brits realized this, of course, and they placed these aircraft into an anti-submarine uh, warfare role in the Atlantic and also in the convoys going over to the Soviet Union. And in that role, the swordfish could still act really well against German submarines. They sunk roughly, estimates go up to uh, two dozen submarines. And the aircraft's properties we did really well in that, uh, that uh, role as well. Okay, so with that rounded up, uh, let's do a walk around as always, starting on the engine, going around the starboard wing, looping around the tail, coming back on the uh, port wing, and then we'll jump inside. There's just one thing I would like to mention. You can already see me wearing a high-vis vest here. I am on an active airfield, so if there's noise in the background, we'll just have to accept that this is what av aviation is all about, right? As I say that, there's going to be a Lynx passing us, so we're just going to wait for that helicopter to make an appearance. I don't know if you can see that in the camera. So let's start up front. We have a three-bladed fixed pitch propeller. Behind it, the Bristol Pegasus 30. That is a 750 horsepower engine. Uh, one stage supercharger weighs about 500 kilograms. From its horsepower alone, not really, really the most competitive engine of World War II. Of course, it's an earlier generation of engine. However, it's, it's an old faithful. It's reliable, it works, it gets the job done. What more do you want? You can also see the, the bundled exhaust here running along the starboard side. And then of course, the engine cowling, uh, the, which could be detached for easy access to the aircraft. Interestingly as well with the swordfish, you have this engine portion up front, and then you have the front portion here, and that is actually separated somewhat, and it gives it this separated look even, uh, with a mounting ring and then these support bearers that go towards the, the mounting ring for the engine. And that gives it that distinctive sort of uh, set off look. We also have a firewall in the front portion of, the, of this portion here. And uh, behind that we have the oil tank, roughly 60 liters in capacity. And of course also the fuel tank slightly further aft, 700 liters plus an additional reserve tank as well. This gill looking device right here, that would be the oil cooler. And the oil cooler could, at least in colder air climates, like for example in the Atlantic or here in Britain, if it's not 2021 and we're being roasted alive, um, could be removed as you see it right here. This is done because this oil cooler is extremely efficient and in colder climates would be overcooling the, uh, the, uh, the oil system. So if you're going into the tropics, this is how you would look like. Beyond that, of course, we have uh, something, if we just turn our attention up towards the support bearers for the top wing, usually you would also find a horizontal bar there. This could be illuminated with reference guidance uh, lamps that allow the pilot to get a better lead and a better bearing uh, for his angle point on an enemy ship when he's launching his torpedo. There's no fancy computing involved in this. It, it is literally just these bars. You take aim, you hope that you've got it right, and then with your instincts, with your training, and then just by gut feeling, you launch your fish, and that is hopefully you scoring a hit on a rudder or something else. Now, as we're moving closer towards the wing, let's first talk about the gear. These fairings here, they hide sort of the shock absorbing oleos. What is an oleo? It's essentially two steel on tubes that have telescopic movement. And inside you either have springs or oil or a combination of both. And as you land, and of course the shock of the landing goes up these oleos, they compress and eventually you resist the shock and then extend again. And that prevents the aircraft's frame and the gear itself really of absorbing the impact of the landing and being damaged in the process. Uh, this is simply is a shock absorbing uh, yeah, suspension, you might say. Having a closer look at the wheel then, 
One of the things you can tell if you're looking closer is that the wheel has an unequal share when it comes to wear and tear on either sides of the thread. So the outer thread is usually wears off quicker than the inner thread. That's because it has a slight camber since the aircraft is designed to essentially carry that torpedo and if it doesn't then obviously the weight on the aircraft is different and the, the wheels will be used or wearing off slightly differently. So what happens is usually that the wheels are reversed every now and then to share that wear and tear uh, on either side. Also have some uh, footrests here for the ground crew to uh, get on to the wing and the engine portion of the aircraft if required. On the wing of course you also have the uh, wing fall release handle that would be sitting here pop that open, somebody supports it on the other side, swing that back and then it needs a couple of men in order to really wrestle uh, that uh, wing into uh, place. The Swordfish also features a single forward-facing Vickers machine gun, free or free in caliber. And to be honest, to this day, I'm not quite sure why the aircraft needs it. In the original specification as a torpedo bomber spotter and reconnaissance aircraft, I don't see much need for it. It's one of those design characteristics that I don't quite comprehend but if you wanted to fire your gun this is essentially where the muzzle would be coming out of as it would be installed inside of the cockpit. Let's turn our attention to the wing shall we? Lower wing, top wing, biplane design, very simple. We have the support struts, we have some bracing wires as well between them and as I mentioned, this is a Mark 1, so you see dope fabric on either side. And of course, the wings are constructed with two main spars running uh, perpendicular to the fuselage and then ribs between those, making up the wing as you would expect it, right? The dope fabric covering extends from the wings all over to the tail of the aircraft. Metal sheeting are used for the engine portion and sort of the front portion of the aircraft. The difference between the top and the lower wing is a slight increase in length on the top wing as well as that it is angled at 4 degrees in order to improve the center of gravity characteristics of this aircraft. That's one of the lessons learned with the crash of the TSR-1, the center of gravity was a bit off. We also have on the top wing, on the leading edge there, we have a slat and that opens up at roughly 110 kilometers per hour and the stalling characteristics of this aircraft are generally so that depending on the load you carry you're going to stall out at say 85 to 95 kilometers an hour but it's very docile when it does so and you can definitely catch it still. On the wing tip here on the lower wing tip we have these two handholds for the wing itself uh, when it is being uh, folded back and of course also this little catch here where you would then later on at the tail deploy a strut and hook it in there to keep it in place. Coming then to the uh, trailing edge, uh, the lower aileron and the top aileron. You'll see a trim tabs, preset trim tabs on the uh, top one. There's no manual adjustments on the trim during flight, so that has to be set by the ground crew uh, at the start of your sortie. And we also have control cables from the pilot's stick only running to the top aileron. The Control input is then translated and relayed via this strut to the lower aileron as well so that it deflects together with the top one. Mind you, the ailerons also act as flaps and as air brakes in the Swordfish because the Swordfish was technically also able to be used as a dive bomber, although it was very rarely used in that capacity, one should say. Coming over then to the central portion of the aircraft. We find the first catapult spool on this side, the second one just next to the ballast weight scale right here. And then before, of course we're gonna jump inside, aren't we? But before we do that, very quick reference here. Up front, of course, the pilot. In the middle would be the observer. And in the back where you see the gun, well, that would be the gunner, right? The aircraft itself, the way it is constructed in the uh, central fuselage is via four longerons, two on either side, a top longeron running along lengthwise, as well as the lower um, longeron doing the same. And between them, you have sort of these diagonal struts that extend vertically and horizontally, and they give the aircraft that tubular steel frame. And then you have some tension wires running between as well to improve the rigidity of this design. As we move 
to the midsection of the fuselage, we see the control cables coming out uh, here. These two ones here would be for the rudder. These two ones here would be for the elevator. And as we follow them along, we start, of course, finding the tail section. Let's turn our attention then to the tail wheel. The tail wheel has a certain bias and it wants to be facing either 12 o'clock or 6 o'clock. To overcome that, you have to overcome a set of springs and that provides a natural resistance that makes it easier for the pilot to stay straight in straight lines on the ground. Whereas if he of course wants to break out left or right, he can use his differential controls on the pneumatic brakes on the, uh, the front gear and eventually he will overcome that resistance in the springs and the wheel will swing around and he's able to turn the aircraft. But that provides sort of a, a rather easy sort of ground handling to the swordfish. Then we also start seeing these struts here. Those are the support bearers for the a horizontal stabilizer as well as these struts right here that are ex can be extended and then that, that hook into the uh, the wing latch uh, on uh, on the lower wing we see additional bracing wires here on top and then we come around to the elevator once again we're starting to see a fixed trim tab there that would be already done as the aircraft is on the ground and we have the rudder now you don't see a rudder trim tab on the swordfish however the vertical stabilizer is already offset by one degree to starboard providing some natural trim for the pilot to work with which is rather nice let's say moving around then of course identification navigational lights in the back of the rudder as well and then let's move once again to the crew portion of the aircraft find the footrest in order to uh, get inside there's also handhold here and we will do so very very soon so just stand by for that interesting thing about the swordfish as well up front and near the engine section we of course also have a dinghy immersion switch right and the dinghy immersion switch activates if the aircraft you've guessed it hits the water it ditches and that sends a signal to a co2 bottle that is mounted in the top wing and that CO2 bottle then immediately inflates a life raft that is stored in the top wing. And as it inflates, it pops a cover and the crew can get inside that dinghy and hopefully wait for um, uh, search and rescue. Should the dinghy immersion switch not work, be defective or whatnot, or should uh, it take too long, the crew also have a manual release. You might also have seen these panels, these uh, see-through windows here. That is for the bomb aimer position. Now the observer, so the second man in the row, he also acts as the bomb aimer if bombs were installed in the aircraft. And he would lie down here and he has an additional window that can be opened just here by moving this cover backwards. And that's where he would be lying essentially between the legs of the pilot aiming the bombs if that was required. And if you wanted to, of course, you could also install a camera right there in order to snap some pictures of the enemy. Now, let's move on to the front portion of the port wing because I want to talk about some of that ordnance that the swordfish can carry. The swordfish is most famous for, let's be honest, for its torpedo, right? This here would be set torpedo. This is a makeup of the Mark 12 18 inch torpedo, which weighs roughly 730 kilograms. That is of course uh, the trademark of this aircraft. However, you could also mount bombs, six, let's say 250 pound bombs, three on either side on the wings of the swordfish or the same weight in depth charges. Additionally to that, you could also be mounting, at least from the, starting from the Mark II, eight three inch 60 pound rockets. And the reason why, of course, the uh, lower portion of the swordfish was covered in metal with the Mark II is, first of all, to provide a little bit more rigidity, but second of all, also to provide protection from those rockets as they're being fired off, because they are, of course, extending fire and smoke and as you're firing them you don't want to become the rocket yourself so that provides a little bit of protection and then of course we also have the landing light right here hello this is chris from the editing booth 
So after filming this episode, I saw an interesting conversation between Matthew Willis, Alexander Clark and Simon Wilson discussing this modification to the wing. It seems that perhaps, even though basically every book says it, that the reasons for the small metal covers on the lower wing might not be directly linked to the RP rocket since they were only fielded sometime after this modification was made. There is no definite information on this as far as I can see, but I thought I'd highlight it here because yeah, there seems to be a little bit of a date discrepancy and I will provide a link in the description to this conversation for you to check yourself as the people involved are serious researchers and also a past swordfish pilot. Right, I think that rounds us up. The last thing I would mention is perhaps that the swordfish could also be equipped with floats. Didn't happen often, but it did happen occasionally. And you had additional mounting struts for that as well, but generally you'd be also using the ones that you use for the gear. And with that said and done, what do you say, uh, shall we jump inside? So let's have a closer look at the two crew positions that are behind the pilot. We have the observer position over here and we have the gunner position over there. So I'm sitting in the observer position, although I'm sure that someone in the comment section has already pointed out that he's actually not known as the observer, but in the fleet air arm, he was known as the navigator, which explains to you already what this chap was doing in the aircraft. He was assisting the pilot with navigation. With this, he had a couple of charts. He also had a couple of uh, instruments to help him read the airspeed and the altitude of the aircraft. And he also had these mountings right here for, well, there should have been one here. Yeah, there is, and over here for uh, the compass reading. Then we also have these spring-loaded cutouts used to pass messages, tea or a sandwich to the pilot outside of the slipstream. Beyond that as well, he could lie down lengthwise under the pilot in the bomb aimer position and uh, take aim with the bombs there if that was required. He also has a slew of cartridges to his left that he can shoot off with his player pistol if he wanted to. And below his position as well, uh, you have the opening for the uh, reconnaissance camera that uh, will allow you to take. Uh, snapshots of whatever you are uh, interested in during your flight. Of course, as the roles of the um, swordfish and the crew members began being compressed, the swordfish did not always fly with three crew members. That really only was the case if it was armed with a torpedo. Sometimes it just had two men in the aircraft, which is why we're going to jump over to the gunner's position, which is right over here. Now, the gunner was again not just known as the gunner, he was known as the TAG, which stands for Telegraphist Air Gunner, which again explains to you the role of the chap right here. He both defends the aircraft and he is also in charge of the radio set. So there would be a radio set mounted right behind uh, his crew position, which he had access to. He was also a, a mechanic, a trained mechanic, and he was able to fix it. And there was also a Morse code button just here on the starboard side that he could operate in order to send out messages. At the same time, of course, uh, in order to defend the aircraft, he had a couple of armor drums strapped around uh, the gun, two on either side here, as well as two additional ones on the left-hand side and one already in the gun. Now the gun itself is mounted on the Fairy patented quick release mount. Fairy was very, very proud of this one because it is spring-loaded, which means that as it is now st in the stored position where it decreases the, uh, the drag of the aircraft, it could, if you spotted uh, a German coming at you, very easily be mounted up. And there you go, you're ready to fire. This part of the aircraft, or this part of the gun rather, but this is really the only part that is heated. There is a heating switch inside the cockpit that um, allows this area to stay warm, especially in the Atlantic convoys and the Arctic convoys. This was important because you didn't want the gun, of course, to be jammed full of ice and uh, not be working. So the trigger was heated, which meant that on those long flights, the, uh, the gunner might just be sitting there uh, taking on the heat. Um, one thing that's important to remind yourself as you're operating this gun is that it has no interrupter which means that potentially you could Indiana Jones yourself if you're not careful and your pilot is not going to be happy if he suddenly loses control of his uh, surfaces in the back, the rudder or the elevator. So you'd have to be a little bit careful as you're operating this gun. Uh, but for the rest, yeah, it's, um, it's a smooth, 
smooth transition from the stored to the deployed position. It also can be fixed in a uh, stored uh, in a uh, open position with these quick release latches here. And yeah, I wouldn't say it really provides great defensive firepower. It's a single gun. It's a rifle caliber uh, machine gun, but it's better than nothing, right? I mean, it is better than nothing. The swordfish could carry a variety of kit. For example, this camera that could be installed in the position of the observer, facing straight down out of the fuselage, allowing the crew to get some reconnaissance pictures of whatever was considered important on the ground or on the sea. Then there is also the Aldis signaling lamp, used to signal friendly troops or ships with messages in Morse code. It's a simple device with a convenient trigger mechanism, allowing you to fire away your dots and dashes. We plugged this into the aircraft's battery system and it worked beautifully. Let's see if you can make out what I'm saying here. Then moving on to the cockpit. It is rather simple, as you might expect given the plane's nature and age. As always, I will take you through it from the left to the right. As this plane is maintained in flightworthy condition, some modern modifications can be found, but I will point those out. Now we start with the light switch panel for downward identification, formation and navigational lights, as well as the headlight. The radio switch to the left is of course modern. Just below that we find the throttle quadrant. The small lever is for the mixture, the larger is your conventional throttle with a press to transmit button. Forward of this, the landing light switch. Below the throttle, the pitch trim wheel. This moves the whole horizontal stabilizer and not a dedicated control surface. And that's us already done on the left. Lower left of the instrument board, we start with the inertia starter clutch. That's the ring you see right there and the magneto switches. You have the booster starter and the booster cutout and to the right the boost gauge with the priming pump. Above this a clock, a lamp deflection control and a triple pressure gauge which I somehow forgot to film. The emergency switch is for the fire extinguisher which was added to allow the plane to fly nowadays. Moving to the right an airspeed indicator in knots with compass lighting control and a fuel gauge lighting control switch. Remember this one. The compass sits in front of you, but it's pretty much unreadable. Unless you deploy this sneaky mirror. Noise, I could navigate all the way to Italy with this. To the right of the compass are two warning lights and the battery switch. Above this you will find a cutout in the instrument board. This is not a mistake. If you look inside you can find two fuel gauges, but they are a little bit hard to pick up on camera. Here, that's one. It currently shows one half. There is a small cutout for natural light during the day and the switch I told you about earlier, the one I said to remember, illuminates a small light to allow you to read these gauges in dark conditions. Below this, the engine gauges, your RPM indicator, your cylinder head temperature, your oil temperature and your oil pressure. A suction gauge is also to the right. In front of you, an artificial horizon, a directional compass and your altimeter. The turn and slip indicator is to the right of the stick. A cockpit light dimmer is installed above a modern IFF and VHF system. This is installed here, substituting the rather optimistically mounted forward-facing fixed gun I spoke about earlier. The ammo of that gun would have been stored in front of the pilot in an ammo container that hooks over his right leg. To the right of the pilot, the fuel cock and the downward-facing identification light control, allowing you to morse or keep a constant beam. Further to the right, we have a pump for carburetor de-icing, a rudder trim, and the arrestor hook release. Above your left knee, the oil bypass valve and the air intake shutter. The former allows you to bypass the oil cooler, resulting in the oil system heating up quicker, whereas the latter allows selection of hot or cold air into the supercharger. The control stick is very simple, with a trigger to the top left and an integrated brake lever. A gun sight would usually be hanging in front of the windscreen with the torpedo sighting bars to either side of the cabans. A flap control wheel is integrated into the wing. The pilot has to reach up in order to manipulate it. 
and these could theoretically also act as air brakes. And that is us done with the cockpit and cruise station. Let's now go through some of the takeoff and flight sequences. Okay, so sitting in the cockpit then of the swordfish, how do you get one of these bad boys into the sky? Well, that's what I'm going to show you right now. Assuming that we've done a couple of the pre-start uh, checkups already, you're now going to move the throttle up just by half an inch, just a smidge towards open. Uh, we're then going to set the mixture to altitude as well. That's sort of our mid setting there. We're going to select the fuel to main only to our right, and then setting also the carburetor uh, intake to cold. The oil cooler is set to in, and the ignition switches are off. Right now, we're going to then signal the ground crew, and the ground crew is going to turn the propeller blades. Now, before we do that, one one pump from the priming pump to get some fuel into the system already, and then those propeller blades are going to start turning by hand. And every time you see a propeller blade passing your 12 o'clock, you're passing at 12 o'clock, you're giving it one push of the priming pump. And that will, of course, then put fuel into all nine cylinders of the engine. Hence, why only we're waiting for nine blades. Once that is done, you signal the ground crew that you're ready, and they will start using the starting handle to energize the inertia, inertia starter of the aircraft. Once you hear the inertia starter being sort of at, at peak RPM, let's say, um, you're going to switch the ignition switches to on and you're going to select the inertia starter. You're going to pull and hold while selecting the boosters as well. And you're going to wait for the engine to catch and then run smoothly. And while that is happening, you just keep on pumping on the priming pump yourself. Now this requires two hands. The left one essentially on the inertia starter holding that, uh, holding that engaged and the, uh, the right hand operating the priming pump. So you have to essentially loop around the control stick with your hand and just keep all everything locked and engaged. Once that has done and the, uh, the engine is uh, running smoothly, then you can just screw down your uh, priming pump, you don't need it anymore, and release the booster coils and set like this, put the master switches to off. You warm up the engine at roughly 1100 RPMs. And as I say that, there's going to be a Lynx passing us. So we're just going to wait for that helicopter to make an appearance. I don't know if we can see that in the camera. So where, uh, where is he? Where is he? Where is he? It's an active airfield. It's above us. It's right. There we go. It is an active airfield. It gives a little bit of ambience. Why not? Is he coming back? I don't even see him. Oh, there he is. Okay, so where was I? Uh, yes, warming up the engine. You're gonna do that at 1,100 RPMs. You're just waiting for your uh, oil temps to go to uh, 50 degrees Celsius, your cylinder heads to 100 degrees Celsius. And then while somebody or a couple of people hold down the tail, you're opening up it up to 1,800 RPMs. As you're doing that, you're then flicking the magnetos, uh, one after the other, to off, to just see the RPM decrease. It shouldn't be more than 100. If it's more than 100, something's gone wrong, and you might have want to check it out. And of course, as you switch it to off, you switch it back to on as well. If then you are going to hunt the Bismarck and cut her down, you are going to be taking off, of course. You're going to be taking off at 2,200 RPMs and a boost setting of plus 0.5 pounds to square inch and you're lifting off at yeah roughly uh, 110 120 kilometers per hour then on your climb you're going to stay at 2200 rpms you're going to go down to a static boost and you're climbing at roughly 130 kilometers an hour your cruise then is going to be at uh, 160 kilometers an hour um, with an rpm 
of 1,900 and minus 4 on your boost. Of course, the aircraft can go faster, not that much faster. At max power, you're going to wrap it up to 2,500 RPMs and plus 2 on your boost. Um, and that gives you 240 kilometers an hour to work with with no external stores, I guess, uh, if we're being uh, optimistic. But landing then, of course, you're setting this aircraft down at roughly 120 to 130 kilometers per hour. And that pretty much concludes us here in the cockpit. And at this point, I just want to say a massive thank you, of course, for, to Navy Wings for allowing us access to this aircraft, for inviting us here and giving us this fantastic aircraft to work with. I hope you enjoyed the video and if you did, please consider also checking out Navy Wings and seeing how you can support them in their quest of keeping this aircraft flying. It is in a flying condition and of course getting other aircraft into uh, back into the sky as well. Check that out in the description below and if you want to support inside the cockpit and the videos that I record here in the museums, engaging with these aircraft, bringing them into your living room. Check out my Patreon and channel memberships as well. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for watching. And as always, have a great day and see you in the sky.